This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 278. Gossip is a cancer inside organizations. Duplicitous people gossip. Dr. Covey said, when you defend those who are absent, you retain the trust of those who are present. Hi there, and welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. It is the podcast that's dedicated to your personal and professional growth, and I am your host, Jeff Brown. And if you were to ask me why I've done the Read to Lead podcast these past six years, I would say something to the effect of, I believe that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, that intentional and consistent reading is a must. You can't have one without the other, in my opinion. The Read to Lead podcast is going to help narrow this ever-important reading list and also bring you key insights and valuable ideas from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. We have just such an author today. He's a very passionate guy. His name is Scott Jeffrey Miller, and he's the author of the book Management Mess to Leadership Success, 30 Challenges to Become the Leader You Would Follow. I'll ask Scott to share about what his experience has taught him about thinking abundantly, what it means to be effective at leading difficult conversations, and why he's so passionate about that idea, what he means when he implores us to allow others to be smart and much, much more. In addition to the book being featured each week here on the show, I'm usually reading a few others. And if you're curious to know uh, what a couple of those might be right now, that would be a book from the author of The Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg, his more recent book, Smarter, Faster, Better, The Secrets of Being Productive in Life and Business, and also Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Two books, by the way, which have been recommended numerous times from previous Read to Lead guests. Well, let's not keep him waiting any longer. Let's welcome Scott Jeffrey Miller. He serves as Franklin Covey's Executive Vice President of Thought Leadership, and he is the host of On Leadership with Scott Miller, a weekly leadership webcast, podcast, and newsletter. He also hosts the weekly iHeart Radio program and podcast, Great Life, Great Career with Scott Miller, and is a leadership columnist for Inc. Magazine. His new book, again, is called Management Mess to Leadership Success, 30 Challenges to Become the leader you would follow. Scott, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm genuinely honored of your interest and your invitation today. I think back to some of the leaders that I've worked for. The, the one that stands out the most is the last leader I worked for, and, and all for, for good reasons. And he was somebody who easily shared credit and, if appropriate, shouldered a share of the blame. What have your experiences, Scott, taught you about uh, thinking abundantly when it, when it comes to your own abilities and, and, and those of your people? You know, Jeff, like you, I have also been the, the almost without exception recipient of generally great leadership. I, yeah. I've had some bosses that were, you know, a little sideways, but we're all a little sideways. So I, I tend to <laughs> be magnanimous and forgive bad bosses because they're just trying to figure it out, right? No one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to try to, you know, make your day hell, right? <laughs> it doesn't happen for most people, unless you're a sociopath. I, <laughs> I think that it's somewhat counterintuitive and it is hard for leaders because leaders are also trying to build their own careers and they've got mortgages, right? They've got kids in school. And so leaders are also trying to make sure that they seem relevant, that they, you know, get credit for their hard work at the same time, be a multiplier of people and be abundant with credit, with resources. I think the best leaders are those that balance both. I think it's naive for any leader to say, you know what, just lift everybody up independent of you and you'll be just fine. I think that's naive. But I think it's a great mindset to always be thinking about, are you lifting up those around you and very deliberately allowing them to shine outside of your own shadow? I mean, I'm I'm a fairly charismatic person. I've been inside of the Franklin Covey Company for 23 years. The fact of the matter is I cast a fairly big shadow. It is hard to shine out from under me. So I have to be extra deliberate to make sure that I am showcasing and lifting up those who report to me. Otherwise, you know, the board and the CEO are likely to give me credit for it. 
just out of FaceTime. So I think it's an intentional, deliberate leadership competency. Manage your own mm-hmm. career, but also lift those around you because they'll hear about it. They'll see about it. I mean, what finer moment is there when you've learned that your boss went into their boss and gave you credit for the work that you did instead of stealing it? That's a fine mm-hmm. moment on both sides. Yeah, I could, I could count on one hand the number of bosses that did that in my past. But uh, thankfully, the, the last one I worked under was somebody I had the chance to work under for about 14 years. So a, a good half of my broadcast uh, career back when I was doing that. I think that employees who have bosses who are stealing credit have to really think about why is my boss stealing credit mm. or taking credit? I mean, it, it comes down to their self-esteem, right? Their self-confidence, their own sense of insecurity in their job, in their talent in their education, the more that you can try to uncover why your leader isn't comfortable giving you credit, the more perhaps you can work through and around that. There is usually a reason they're doing it. I'm not defending it at all. But the more you can understand, as Dr. Covey calls it, you know, their private victory, how strong or how weak their private victory is, right? Their own sense of self-worth and confidence. The more you can find ways to either get credit for yourself question them on it, give them reasons to move beyond their own insecurity. I mean, it is a case of insecurity. Pretty much that's it. Mm. Well, one of the the 30 challenges that Scott uh, lists is to to listen first. It's a, it's a challenge in part, Scott says, because, and I like this, listening sucks. <laughs> so, Scott, as, as someone with a propensity, in your own words, to interrupt, how do you work at, at being a better listener? You know, Jeff, I wrote this book, Management Mess to Leadership Success, because I, after, you know, 30 years in the industry of leadership development, and as an executive leader myself, realized I've had a lot of messes. I'm not a complete mess, right? I've had some <laughs> lot of successes, but I wanted to be vulnerable and share with the audience. It's okay to admit your messes. Everybody knows about them. Everybody's talking about them. Just acknowledge them. One of my biggest messes is, again, a result of one of my successes. You know, any success taken too far can become a mess. I, I'm a fairly seasoned and trained communicator. Like you, I host a podcast. I host a radio program on iHeartRadio. I give keynote speeches for a living. I've been taught to be an expert, if you will, at persuasion, influence, selling, communicating. And when as leaders, we've spent so much time investing in training our own communication skills, we rarely have spent much time in our listening skills. And listening is a communication competency. Listening is really a selfless gift. Talking selfish. Listening is selfless. Too many of us listen to respond, right? We listen to reply. We're on our own timeline. We're on our own agenda. We're on our own narrative. We, we have good intentions. We're trying to solve the other person's problem when in fact, they usually don't want us to solve it. They just want us to listen. So I think listening is counterintuitive. It takes great discipline. It takes a selfless desire of empathy to really get into the other person's head. And, and if you're like me at all, I tend to be a consummate interrupter. Because I want to solve the other person's problem. I want to speed it along. You know, Dr. Deborah Tannen, the famed author of numerous books, the linguistics professor from Georgetown, says most people interrupt because we have our own version of how long the other person should be talking, right? I might think Jeff should talk for 48 seconds to be quiet. And Tina should talk for, you know, 52 seconds. But we interrupt because we have a subconscious narrative of how long you should be talking. And I think a great way to minimize your interruption is to be conscious of it. The next time you're compelled to interject or interrupt or top their story or you know ask them to move along, resist it. Put your lips together. Close your lips very gently. Count to seven. Count to 10. It's in that time, Jeff, that it's highly likely the other person will either stop talking, finish up, or even disclose an especially sensitive or delicate or sincere point that kind of brings it all together. I I think it takes intentional, deliberate practice to become a better listener. Mm -hmm. It certainly does. I I know one thing that that I need to watch out for is someone could be sharing something with me that they enjoyed or something they did that they had fun doing or 
I, it could be something, I don't know, a movie they watched that they liked. And often my first response can be my experience with the same thing. And, and, and if, if it's a negative experience versus their positive experience and I start making it about me, suddenly I've kind of shut them down and they have nothing else to talk about. They have nothing else to share about that experience because I've just halted the whole conversation by saying, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't really care for that. I didn't like that. Greg, that speaks to your self-awareness. And I think if you want to become a success in your leadership style as parenting, as a parent, as a spouse, as a friend, really developing your self-awareness around what you just said. I do the same thing. We all do exactly what you just said. We just don't tend to admit to it, admit to our messes. So I applaud your own self-awareness. That's kind of half the battle in, in, in every mess. Hmm. Well, um, I was intrigued when I opened the book before reading it and going through the table of contents, and there was this one challenge called Carry Your Own Weather. What, what does that mean exactly? Sure. So like much of my book, a lot of the concepts were with permission borrowed <laughs> from wiser people than me. This concept was popularized by Franklin Covey's co-founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, of course, the author of the seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That book has sold 30 million copies in 30 years. And Dr. Covey really talked about, you know, in Habit 1, be proactive. Proactive people are very deliberate and not giving over their emotional weather to other people. We all have reactivity tendencies and that proactive people, highly effective people, people who move from mess to success are very deliberate in not letting other people hijack your state of mind, your mood, your outlook. We don't, we don't let anybody else interrupt our mission, our passion, our decision to you know drive our own goals to the finish line. Now, now says easy, does hard. But it really is this concept that Viktor Frankl wrote about in, you know, Man's Search for Meaning around, you know, in life, we have complete choice over our decisions and our reactions. And so as you metaphorically carry your own weather, you are mindful of the type of situations that irritate you, the meeting, the person, the waiter, you know, the preacher, whoever it is in your life that kind of gets under your skin, you think about it. You take some time to kind of unpack it, unwind it. Why in every meeting does Jim kind of get under my nerves with his first sentence? And you don't, you don't give up your control of your emotions. When the boss walks in the morning and she slams the door and walks past you into your office and you think, oh my gosh, I'm getting fired today, you've given over your emotional weather. It very well could be she had a fight with her teenage daughter, probably is. The more grounded I think, Jeff, we are in our values and in our worth, the less likely we are to give our emotional weather over to somebody else. You know, a leadership lesson that I learned uh, several years ago was to extend trust to others, Scott, by default until they give you a reason to do otherwise. How has your career, would you say, been impacted by the trust that others have extended to you along the way? You know, Jeff, I, I might have lived a poly in a life, but I have not been double-crossed a lot. I, I have. I, I have people that have violated my trust, no question. I, I'm usually smart enough not let someone get the best of me because, you know, those people exist. Without question, I am the beneficiary of being on the receiving end of people pre-extending trust to me. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think it's also a result of me making good decisions. I practice something I say that some people misinterpret. I call it friending up. I have very deliberately in my life always friended up, smarter, wiser, older, more cultured, more seasoned, better educated, wealthier, better, cult, you name it, right? I, I'm, I'm very deliberate around wanting to be around people that are wiser than me. And therefore, those people are usually more you know, trusted and trustworthy. So I have been very deliberate about the relationships I enter into. And there's no question I can, in fact, I name it in my book, you know, about a half dozen people who absolutely extended trust to me. And sometimes when I didn't earn it or even deserve it. And I think, you know, you can live your life mistrusting people. And by all means, people have had, you know, horrific violations in their life. I do not mean to undervalue that or not appreciate that. Generally speaking, I think leaders, successful leaders, extend trust even sometimes when it wasn't warranted. You know, it doesn't mean you don't, you don't keep, you know, keep tabs or you, you know, monitor, check in. But great leaders extend trust to people in the hopes that they can earn it back with, you know, smart trust. And, and, and I am absolutely on the receiving end of people that believed in me more 
than perhaps I believed in myself. I'll bet they monitored me more than I knew it. But hey, you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather have that than someone not have had faith in me. And I'm sure I've let people down. I tried to keep most of my promises, but I, I would encourage people, even if your trust has been violated in the most horrific of ways, don't let that harden your spirit by extending trust to others, because that can be your legacy. It is the legacy of many leaders who, um, who lifted me up. Well, leading uh, difficult conversations is challenge number 12. And I had just read that uh, chapter, that challenge, Sunday morning, right before seeing a friend who re- uh, relayed to me that he was going to be having to let somebody go uh, soon. And so I passed along to him the wisdom that I learned from Scott's book on that challenge. And Scott says in that chapter that, and I quote, if you don't lead difficult conversations, step down immediately, call your leader and tell them you can't continue in your role any longer. <laughs> Why do you feel so strongly about this one, Scott? Yeah, you've struck a nerve. This is by far my most passionate of all the challenges. It is incumbent on every leader to have difficult conversations, to discuss the undiscussables. You know, many people say to me, well, Scott, you're so good at it. Well, I'm good at it because I've done it 2,000 times. You know, I didn't come out of the womb being high courage. I, I think most of us are cowards. And Jeff, that's not a character flaw. That's just kind of a personality trait or a competency that we need to grow into. One of the best gifts, perhaps the greatest gift any leader can give their team members is to be that transition figure in their life that had the courage to tell them the truth, the truth about their breath, their personal hygiene, their productivity, their self-awareness, their skills, their deficits, their ability to collaborate, their self-awareness, their strengths and their weaknesses, their blind spots. And, and I, some people might think, oh my goodness, you're crossing the line. Listen, every team has their standards. Every company has their culture. I have had conversations about people's personal hygiene. Sometimes it has to be done by HR. Sometimes if it's cross gender, you might need someone else in the room. But I have said to people before, because I cared about them, listen, This is a sensitive conversation. I have your best interest in mind, and you have my word that this conversation will never leave this room. I've noticed, like me, you might be breaking through your deodorant. This is a sensitive conversation. I don't want to embarrass you. All of us sometimes tend to, you know, sweat at different places at different times, and sometimes we kind of, quote, break through our interperspirate. I just want to give you, because I care about you, a little bit of notice. You might want to change up or add more and a purse put on because I'd hate for you ever to be in an embarrassing situation. That's all it takes. Nine out of 10 people are going to be horrified and mortified. But you know what? They're going to so appreciate that later on. Your zipper is down, whatever it is. I don't mean to be a comedian right now, but I mean to be real. Oftentimes, every leader before you was probably either avoiding or ignorant or just didn't have the courage to talk about things that are important to people. Everybody's got blind spots. That doesn't mean as the leader of a company, it's your job to go around and talk about people's dress or all of their um, hygiene issues. But some cases it might be, Jeff, I'm 51 years old. I've made lots of mistakes in my life. I have hired hundreds of people and I've terminated dozens of people. Inevitably, when someone sees me in an airport five, 10, 15 years later or connects with me on LinkedIn, the one compliment that's consistent people pay me is Scott, You were crazy, you were this, you were hard, you were that. But you were the one leader who had the courage to tell me what nobody before you would do. Thank you for doing that. So everybody's got to kind of find your own um, own style. Role play it with a senior executive leader. Practice it. When you've got a difficult conversation, next time open it up and say, listen, this is going to be a difficult conversation. I'm going to ask you to pre-forgive me. I might get some of the words wrong. I'm probably going to mess it up. I'm not perfect at this. I really want to give you some advice or some feedback or I've got a difficult conversation. I've got to tell you, um, today's your last day in the company and I feel for you and your job is being terminated and I want to talk to you about why. I'm probably not going to get all the reasons exactly right or say all the right words. Would you pre-forgive me on that? Whatever the scenario is, most people will let down their guard when they know where your intent is. If you declare your intent up front, they're going to get better. I, I'm sorry, Jeff, that was a long answer, but I'm very passionate about this. Is this a good time to tell you, Scott, that you've got some uh, food stuck between your teeth? 
<laughs> you know what? Thank you for telling me that. I'll make sure to check that more often. But you know what, Jeff? I mean, that's what friends do. Friends yeah. say, you know, you know, you're, you need a you need a breath mint, right? I mean, it's it's horrifying for a second. But if Jeff told me I needed a breath mint, I would think, oh my gosh, Jeff cares about me. Hmm. I'm horrified for a second, but you know what? The guy has my best interest in mind. I, you just you crossed a bridge with me that kind of has built some loyalty in me. Thanks for caring about me. If I had a nickel for every time my wife told me I need a breath mint. <laughs> me too, sir. <laughs> a rich man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm almost, uh, I almost feel bad asking about this, this, this next part, but Scott writes about it in the book, so I, I assume it's fair game. Years ago, he actually had a member of his team privately tell him, Scott, everybody here hates you, and if something doesn't change, we're all going to quit. How did you, Scott, respond to that revelation? You know, perhaps I should be more embarrassed about this, but I really felt that sharing my messes could be so helpful for other people on, on every side of the coin. Mm, absolutely. So, you know, I'm not embarrassed about that at all. I, I'm not embarrassed of most of what I've done in life because I've learned from it. I've apologized. I've asked for forgiveness and I've moved on and hopefully changed. You know, I tell you, it was it was it was mortifying. But you know what? I was mature enough to realize and, you know, you might think I'm a narcissist, but I want to share this. As a leader, I'd done lots of things wrong, but I'd also done some things right. And what I had done right was establish a culture where that young man who was not an especially courageous man, who now has gone on to enormous success, we're very good friends, he is now the president of Franklin Covey. He has eclipsed me and has moved beyond me. But what I had done is I had established a culture where it was safe to talk to the boss that way, and I was the boss. So he came in. He summoned a tremendous amount of risk and culture or, or, or courage. We sat down. We closed the door. We both kind of cried. And I was probably a little defensive. I wasn't belligerent. We talked through it. We talked about, you know, some of the pressures that I was under, some of the insane things I was, you know, demanding from people. I think it improved. I will tell you to this day, almost everybody in that office and I are still very good friends. They call me for jobs and I recommend them on LinkedIn. And I think people uh, knew what my intent was and that I was genuinely a very trustworthy person under a lot of pressure, making um, not unethical or immoral decisions, just, you know, being a bad boss, right? Good people can be bad bosses. But to that point, Jeff, I don't think everybody should be a leader. I think I have lots of talents. I don't know that leading people is one of my natural talents. Mm -hmm. I think too often people are lured into a leadership position because they're the best salesperson or they're the best nurse or the best designer. I think people want a bigger title, a better paycheck, a better office, when in fact they should just be an individual contributor. So in that scenario, I really applaud both sides of the party, me for setting the conditions and him for having the courage to talk straight. And we worked through it. And to this day, 15 years later, we're still very good friends. And like I said, he has gone on to eclipse me inside the organization. Kudos to him. Mm. Well, near my home is the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions. That's a company founded by financial guru Dave Ramsey. In fact, they yeah, just... A good friend of mine. Yeah, they just moved into a brand new building uh, and they're closer to my house now than they were before. M many of my friends uh, who work there tell me that gossip is something that, that Dave and his staff do not tolerate. And... I'd be curious to know, Scott, what concept related to this did, did you learn when you joined Franklin Covey all those years ago? Dr. Covey has a saying um, of being loyal to the absent. And that means, in essence, that effective people, successful people, people who leave behind their messes and move towards successes are people who speak about those who are absent the same way that they would if you were present. Meaning if Jeff is on a plane to Chattanooga, and he's not in the meeting with me, I would speak about Jeff as if he were right there. It is a high standard, but it will transform your own brand, your team, your division, your company, your culture, your industry. Because gossip is a cancer inside organizations. Everyone does it. I've done it. But when the leader sets the standard, with which our CEO, Bob Whitman, has. He does not tolerate gossip. He doesn't engage in it. If someone says something even around the lines, he will say, well, Scott's not here. Let's suspend that conversation until Scott's plane lands. Let's get Scott on the line and, and tell us what he was thinking. Let's assume good intent. Another way to stop it, someone is gossiping to you. 
and they're saying, you know what? Jim drives me crazy. He's never on time. He's so selfish. He just gabs on. It's, you know what? You know what? I'll bet Tim would have his feelings hurt if he heard that. And I'm sure that's not your intention. So I'm going to suspend judgment. And if I ever see that in Tim, I'll tell Tim directly. So again, this is a high standard, but it's the right standard. Gossip is a cancer inside organizations. Duplicitous people gossip. Decide today. You are going to speak about people when they are not in your presence as if they were. Dr. Covey said, when you defend those who are absent, you retain the trust of those who are present. Because if I see you trash talk other people, I know you're going to trash talk me. It's a high standard, but it can be transformative if the leader of the team decides to implement that level of behavior. Uh, the next question I want to ask you, Scott, uh, is something you've hinted at when you were talking about insecure leaders earlier. But in Challenge 21, you, you call allowing others to be smart. Why is it important uh, in, in your view that as leaders, we ask ourselves and those working for us, what's it like being in a professional relationship with me? You know, Jeff, I know you and I have a mutual friend, um, Liz Wiseman, of course, the author of the seminal book, mm. Multipliers. If your audience hasn't purchased Multipliers, I think it's one of the best, if not the best leadership book written in the last decade. Liz talks about how most leaders try to be the genius and not the genius maker. And it was it just, it was such a profound moment for me is, you know, I have worked for leaders who were or needed to be the smartest person in the room. And I have often been the smartest person in the room. In my own mind. In fact, I served as Franklin Covey's chief marketing officer for just shy of a decade. And there was a common joke in the room that best idea wins as long as it's Scott. And I, and I, and I don't mean to say that's funny because although it is funny, it's also insightful and horrifying and humiliating and action worthy. So I think it's a good question for leaders to ask themselves. What's it like to be in a meeting with you? What's it like to work on a project with you? What's it like to work for you? In fact, you know what? Go ask people. They won't tell you the truth unless you've created a culture where it's safe to tell you the truth. Because if you deflect and defend and bully them, no one is stupid enough to create that career cul-de-sac in their life. Who would tell their boss their presentation sucked unless the boss was genuine about the feedback? But go ask some trusted colleague. What's it like to work with me? What's it like to be married to me? And make a promise to yourself. You won't defend it. You won't talk it away. You won't deflect it. Doesn't mean you can't ask some clarifying questions, but whatever you do, don't explain it away or say, oh, you do the same thing or I do that because. Just be quiet because a great leader's job is to multiply talent, attract talent, retain talent, and actually attract and retain talent that is smarter than you. People who are great leaders are humble enough, they're confident enough, they're secure enough to surround themselves with people who are smarter than them. And that's a lesson I learned about 25 years later than I should, Jeff. Mm. I mentioned that leader I last worked for. He was, he was the epitome of leveraging the collective brain power. Uh, in the room. Lucky you. <laughs> when it comes to uh, vision, Scott says it's not enough as a leader to have vision. Leaders create vision, and uh, it's a mistake to assume that your work is done after you create it. I'm wondering if you would, would expound on that a bit, Scott. Yeah, I think in my experience from traveling the world, working with thousands of CEOs and leaders and all of that, that too often leaders think that their job is to, like I said earlier, you know, give the grand speech, paint the grand plan, and maybe repeat it a couple of times, but that's like 10% of the job, right? Every leader knows you do have to repeat the vision a bunch of times. You do have to recommunicate it via more presentations and more town halls, but that isn't enough, and you're fooling yourself if you think it's just enough to give the grand speech and then think it's all going to translate down into reality. I mean, that's insanity, right? You have to not just clarify the vision, create the vision, you got to then roll up your sleeves and sometimes be in the trenches. You have to not just construct the goal in a from X to Y by when format, right? We're going to increase customer retention from 80% to 84% by the end of the fiscal year. 
you then have got to work with your senior leaders or if you're a mid-level leader, your junior leaders and translate it into their behaviors. What are they going to actually do differently tomorrow? They've got to either learn something new or do something different. And so do you. So don't rest on the fallacy, the naivete, that because you painted some grand vision, that that's going to work out. That's just lunacy. You've got to have the stamina, the humility, and the dogged determinism to see it through. I think too often senior leaders think they've earned the right just to lead the troops. You know what? Sometimes the best thing you can do as a leader to ensure that your vision comes to reality, roll up your sleeves, walk down to the production room, and go stuff 100 envelopes or go you know, help set up the room. Not because it's above you or beneath you, but you want people to see that you know what it takes and you're committed to helping. I can tell you one time, our chief financial officer, a man of extraordinary intelligence, character, he's way above you know, rolling up his sleeves. He went down to the warehouse once and helped us pack like 6,000 boxes. And I will never forget the 80 people watching Steve Young roll up his sleeves and his shirt cuffs and his tie and pack a bunch of boxes for a big client promotion. I think that built more loyalty to him than any spreadsheet, investor call, stock market, you know, increase. It was, it doesn't have to be daily, even monthly, but be deliberate in showing your people that you know what it takes to not just communicate, create, but fulfill a vision. You know, Scott, you mentioned your particular passion for one challenge earlier, but I, I can hear the passion in every one I've asked about, and I appreciate you bringing that uh, with you today very, very much. We, we've covered uh, maybe a third of the 30 challenges. I do have a couple of questions that I want to ask you, not directly related to the book, but before I do that, anything else you want to make sure we walk away with? I feel like I've, I've answered really long, so I'll lend the time back to you. <laughs> All right. Well, I want you to, uh, and this is going to be tough, I know, but think about the books you've read over the course of your career, or if you need to narrow that down in your mind, maybe the last few years. Well, what would you say are the two or three titles that immediately come to mind as having had the, the biggest impact on you? You know, I mentioned one of them, Liz Wiseman. I cannot evangelize Liz's book enough, Multipliers. It is a book that talks about how all of us want to be multipliers as leaders, but we end up becoming accidental diminishers. And so I highly recommend that book. Uh, you know, there's a book written by Brian Grazier. He's a famed, you know, movie producer. He's part of Imagine Entertainment. He wrote a book, I think it's called Curiosity, or it's, it's about being curious. And I highly recommend this book because I think the best leaders are those that have an insatiable curiosity, right? They constantly are challenging their own paradigms. And this book that Brian Grazier wrote was amazing. There's another book that literally changed my life by a man named Eric Barker. It's a bit of a social scientist. He wrote a book called Barking Up the Wrong Tree. And it basically was a book where he dispels a bunch of common myths in life that we've led to believe are true about how to be successful. And in it, he talked about the power of owning your own story, like literally out loud telling yourself your own story where you were born, how you were raised, what are your fears, what are the lies told about you, what are the truths told about you, and what do you plan to do about that going forward? So Barking Up the Wrong Tree, written about maybe three years ago, was an enormously powerful book. You notice I didn't mention in your Franklin Covey's books because I didn't want to feel self-serving. Mm. But I mean, you know, the book, The Speed of Trust by Stephen M. R. Covey, there's a reason that book has sold two million copies. And I've mentioned The Seven Habits. There's a reason that book sold 30 million copies. So like you, I read about two to three books a week because of my job and the way I interview. But those are three or four of my top favorites. That Brian Grazer book, by the way, I looked it up, A Curious Mind, The Secret to a Bigger Life. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, I've, I've had others recommend that to me before, and I haven't picked that one up. So I'm going to make it a point to do that yeah, this week. Can I share 30 seconds about that book? Oh, sure. Absolutely. What struck me in that book was he was talking about how he does research for which you know uh, movies to green light and produce, and he had he had a particular movie that escapes me what the name was, but he went to interview the famed physicist scientist Isaac Asimov, who died I don't know five six years ago, and he went to lunch with this famed scientist Isaac Asimov to learn from him. And during the lunch, early on, Isaac's then wife it wasn't his first wife stopped the interview with Brian Grazier, this famed 
movie producer and says, it is clear based on your questions that you have not adequately prepared for this interview. My husband deserves better than this. This lunch is over. Mm. And in essence, she took her husband up and they left the lunch. Now, at face value, I'm sure I bastardized that story. But Brian says, you know what? She was right. I hadn't. And so that lesson was just about, you know, doing your preparation before whatever interview, presentation, asking for a raise, high courage conversation. Have you done the proper preparation worthy of the conversation? And that has never been lost on me since reading that book. Well, now I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I hope I've, <laughs> hope I've, hope I've prepared well for this. <laughs> You've been very gracious letting me um, rant on. <laughs> well, as someone who is a successful keynote speaker, Scott, I'd be curious to uh, hear what some of your tips might be for delivering an impactful and, and memorable talk. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, never use PowerPoint again. <laughs> do not bring a laptop. Do not bring a clicker. Do not use PowerPoint or a keynote or any slides. Know your content so well that you stand up and you speak from the heart because then you are looking at your audience. You're not a slave or enslaved to the cadence of your deck. You're just speaking to the people. And I know, I know the power of visuals. I'm very clear on that. I'm a CMO, right? Stop using PowerPoint, stand up and speak from the heart. Second, obviously is this idea of knowing your audience. You know, I don't have a fear of public speaking. I'm rare in that. Most people aren't critiquing you as much as you think they are, you know, in terms of knowing your audience and preparing, you can't prepare enough, or perhaps you can't, right? If you over-prepare, you're going to seem rote. Just be relaxed, be confident, get there early, understand the layout, know the room, what is the audience struggling with, you know, what do they need to know? You might need to repeat it a couple of times, come off the stage, connect with your people, never, ever, 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 ever ever stand behind a podium, put it aside, and just connect with your people. I, I don't want to sit through another speech from a podium or somebody going through 80 PowerPoint slides, looking at a monitor in front of them. So th that's what I would say is you'll never see me give a speech from a PowerPoint deck ever again. Mm. Yes, there are graphs that I probably should show. Yes, there are logos and pictures that might make it different or better. But I think that people came to learn from me and that's what I'm going to deliver. Challenge accepted. That's something that I, I struggle in my mind with, with letting go of that tool. But, but uh, you've convinced me. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try that next time out. I'm honored. Uh, last question. What's, what's ahead for you and your team? What, what's around the corner that, that uh, has you excited about that you'd, you'd like to share? Thanks. Well, um, I have a second book that's coming out October 8th by Simon & Schuster. I'm the co-author of that book. It's called Everyone Deserves a Great Manager, The Six Critical Practices for Leading a Team. That's a book with, obviously, Franklin Covey. Very excited about being a co-author on that book. And then my publisher that published Management Mess to Leadership Success has um, optioned eight additional titles. So I am now in the process of writing Marketing Mess, to brand success that will come out sometime next spring. The third book will be Job Mess to Career Success. And then I have a whole Mess to Success series mm -hmm. planned around sales, relationships, communication, parenting. I think in the next decade, you will see a whole Mess to Success branded series where I'll be writing and speaking and blogging about that because I do think there is enormous power in admitting your message. You know, I'll end, Jeff, with a very dear friend of mine is ironically from your hometown, Indianapolis. Her name is Rebecca Hessian. She's a former associate of mine at Franklin Covey. She said something that is perhaps the most profound thing I've ever heard. She said, and I quote, you think they don't know, they do. Mm. And for me, there is enormous power in just admitting your messes. Everyone's talking about them. Everyone knows them. Don't wallow in them. Own them, fix them, and move from mess to success. Well, with that information, I think it's safe to say uh, you may be getting future invitations to come back to the Read to Lead podcast if you'll, if you'll have us. <laughs> I, I would be honored, sir. And thanks for your passion around reading and literacy. Thanks to the platform today. Um, I'd be honored to be back on whenever you thought I, I was worthy of it. 
One more time, Scott's book is called Management Mess to Leadership Success, 30 Challenges to Become the Leader You Would Follow. For a link to that book, the books that both Scott and I recommended, or to connect with Scott via social media, just check out the show notes page created just for this episode. You'll find that at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 278 for episode 278. If you have questions or comments or feedback on Read to Lead, well, if you do, you can send that to me directly, jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. Any books you've read recently that you think should be featured on Read to Lead but haven't been yet, let me know. Well, that's going to do it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. 